and pull out your Bibles and turn over to the book of 1 John. But you knew that, didn't you? Chapter 2. Hope everybody's had a good week. You have to stay with me this morning because the Wiltern is a little bit more challenging speaking venue than the Hyatt. You know what I'm saying? You all sitting a little bit closer. I can see you. You know, I just bring my shades up here so I can see everybody. I see Craig in the back over there. Hey, man, Craig, thanks. But you got to stay with me because it's easy to get lost in this building. And I got a lot of important things to say. Because I'm preaching the Bible, so we're safe there. If it's just me, you know, who cares? You know, uh, last week as we started our study of the book of 1 John, and one of the things I told you about that inspired me about John the Apostle was as he got later on in in years, and we talked about uh, when the book was written, John was getting on there in years, and how he stayed so positive, so fired up, so joyful and grateful about being a Christian in spite of seeing his best friends martyred, uh, seeing, you know, a number of problems that were in the churches, specifically what John writes about here, dealing with Gnosticism. And, you know, I said, but, you know, I, I want to be like John. And, and this week, I, I, it finally started dawning on me. You know, it's probably a little embarrassing that it takes as long as this, but, you know, it really started clicking with me why John was that way and you know we know a little bit of history about John and some of the the sort of the the story surrounding John is that he spent so much time in prayer that his knees had really thick calluses on him look kind of like elephant knee I said you know what that John stayed so positive because he never took his eyes off Jesus It's like the image of Jesus hanging on the cross. As John was standing, it was like it was indelibly printed on his vision that whenever he looked at somebody or a problem or something going on at church, it's like he saw Jesus hanging on the cross first and then he saw sort of the person behind it and saw the power of the cross to change people's lives and to fix any situation that needed fixing through love and preaching holding people accountable of being a great example himself and certainly you see as back in the first century you know last week we talked about that and you know we, you know some of us saying oh well, I wish I would live back then and you know I basically said no you don't and we went through that you know there's a, a lot of things there as you look at we look through the rest of the letter here or going on with what we're going to talk about today that John is writing this letter to refute the Gnostic doctrine and the teachings that are going around in the church. This is not John speaking to his own church, but it's being sent out to other churches with this situation. Now, as we read through this, and we realize it's a major challenging thing that, that John himself wasn't really there to address it. He's sent a letter and had it read to the church. Can you imagine being a, a Christian in that congregation, hearing John's letter, and really deciding... In your heart, which way am I going to go? Am I, you know, if you catch yourself, you know, starting to live that, that easy grace, sort of, you know, it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh, as long as your spirit is right with God. And hearing the letter read, and then going, I'm not in a good place spiritually, and either deciding to repent, back to being a disciple again, and what it means to follow Jesus, or just from hearing a letter. And certainly shows John's confidence in the Holy Spirit that when the word is preached, the people with hearts for God will do the right thing. And so I hope you're with me this morning as we listen to the word of God, as we read John's letter, as we look at how it applies to our lives today, that it really open your eyes and I'm confident that as you listen this morning, the Holy Spirit will speak very clearly to you what he wants you to do. And then simply the onus is on you about what you will do when you leave this building. Let's open in a word of prayer. God, we ask that you be with us this morning as we look into your word, as we continue studying the book of 1 John. We pray that truly the Spirit would be with us this morning and guide us, speak to us, convict us, encourage us, give us peace, 
I pray that we would really uh, take away the excuses of how we've been doing spiritually or whatever it might be. And really look at ourselves in light of you and really make a decision that as John speaks to us here, as the Holy Spirit instructed him to you, that you also would speak to us this morning. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, it reads, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have had, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And of all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. There's a lot of talk today about the Antichrist. Uh, you know, some, you know, it's a very popular thing if you watch religious TV where people, you know, try to put together a revelation and they start naming names today. So, you know, Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist. You know, you heard that one back in 91 or 92. You know, pay, you know take your pick of, of world leaders that, uh, you know, have, have opposed Christianity or even the United States. And people go, well, that, that's the Antichrist. You know, I'm sure they're not nice people. But the Bible goes on here and John talks about, not talking about the Antichrist, but there are many. Talking about the Gnostics here. Specifically, those who deny that Jesus came in incarnation, in the flesh, came as the Son of God, anti-Christ. And certainly anti-Christ applies to those that are teaching anti-Christ teachings, things that Jesus did not teach. Or in direct contrast to things that Jesus taught. We talked about that last week, about how the Gnostics denied those things about Jesus, denying the Father. And John goes on in this passage to, to call them the liars and deceivers. But there are many. And they had left the church because they had nothing left in common with the disciples. And a lot of people want to use this passage here to interpret this as, you know, falling away or things like that. Like, you know, if somebody falls away, it's not really falling away because you were never really converted. You never really became a Christian. And so the fact that you left shows that you were never really saved. But that's not really true. There's two ways to leave the church. One is, is that you really were born again. That you believed in Jesus, the Son of God. That you believed that your sin crucified him. You were responsible. That as you made your confession at baptism, you, re you believed in your heart that your faith was saving you. God was wiping out your sins. And you lived for a time as a faithful disciple, following the commands of Jesus. And then whatever it might be, sin, hardening your heart or person's heart, loving the world more, of falling away from Christ. Then there's another way to leave where you never really were born again. And it's not just the Gnostic doctrine either, but it could be having unrepentant sin in your heart. Coming to, to church and realizing, yes, this is what I want for my life. And living in sin, maybe living in immorality. Of not being open about it. And not talking about it. Of going through the motions of being baptized and still living in immorality. You were never born again. 
because there's no difference. There's no rebirth. There's no break from the old to the new. And John is really getting into talking about this part here, about people not grasping the truth about who Jesus was. He was the Son of God in the flesh. That he came to earth. He lived a sinless life. That he, God and man, in one form, Jesus died on the cross to take our sins because we could not save ourselves. And John's saying, you know, they, they've gone because they, they don't belong to us. They don't belong to Christ. We read that in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13 about being baptized into the body, about being a part of the body of Christ. Realize, you know, that, that's, we're all in this together. There's parts of the body, you know, the part, you know, I'm, I get to be the speaker today. You get to be the listener. If we had a bunch of listeners and no speaker, what good would that be? If we had a speaker and no listeners, that would be equally useless. So we're all playing a role here today. These people really living in this way were really messing people up. And they were pulling disciples away from the truth. Now, when you try to pull people truth, uh, pull people away from the truth, it's easier if you make their lifestyle easier. I've heard that a lot. You people are too committed. You sacrifice too much. You go to church too much. You give too much money. You're a fool. And yet you look at the apostles... Certainly in the example of John, he, he just flat lays it out. These people are the Antichrist. Now, if ever, somebody ever calls you the Antichrist, that's not a compliment. <laughs> it's not like, you're the Antichrist. Okay, thanks, man. You look at the life of Jesus. Certainly, if you want to look on hard line, being a disciple, just look at the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You go through and read those scriptures and ask yourself, is Jesus calling us to the easy way? You look at uh, Galatians 1, verse 8, where Paul is addressing some issues with the Galatian churches there. And he says, if anybody else is preaching another gospel, let him be eternally condemned. That's how much confidence Paul had in that he preaching the Word of God. It had nothing to do with him. It had nothing to do with an easy lifestyle. He was helping people be saved. And he said, you know, I have you know, no problem saying that. You know, that's one of those things you got to ask yourself. Do I really share my faith? And do I preach the Word that if I say, if you're not doing it like me, then, you know, you let you be eternally condemned. If you are trying to deceive people about what it means to follow Jesus. Because if you don't have that confidence, if you don't have that boldness, if you don't really believe that you are sold out for Jesus and that you are obeying the scriptures, you have the seeds of Gnosticism in your heart. You have the seeds of your own destruction sown in your heart. And then if given enough time and the right set of circumstances, they will blossom and kill you. The Gnostics were talking about, you know, come with us. We talked about their recognizing their immoral acts, but not recognize them as sinful, as, as breaking that relationship with God. How enticing. You can live any way you want to live and still be saved. What a lie. You can live in immorality and be saved. You don't even have to come to church if you don't want to and be saved. You don't have to love your neighbor and be saved. You don't have to love your brother and you can be saved. Because it's not really you. It's that evil body that you've been possessed with. 
And you know, we talked about last week, really, the, the Gnostic teaching being very prevalent, though not a name, in practice today, in what we call Christianity in America, especially. That you can find, if you want to live a certain way, you can find a church that will take you as a member in good standing. It's a fact. It's a fact. No matter your lifestyle, no matter what it is, your sin you just love, you can find a church that will accept you and tell you you're a good person. And you'll be able to be a member until the day you die and go to hell. Turn over, keep your fingers, we're gonna come back here to the book of 1 John, but turn over with me to, to Luke 16. I, I wanna address uh, a little bit here Some of these things where taking the easy way out is very, very tempting. And I want to talk specifically on the issue of money. Last week, uh, you know, we gave our special missions contribution. That's awesome. So fired up to do that. To be able to see God doing incredible things all over the world. You know, you see K&N, you're just so fired up. You know, that missions countdown at the end there. Man, it was like, if you were here when K&N first started, it was like, you know, 200. You know, you're like, oh, will we ever reach our goal? You know, and now it's like 17. You're like, oh, man, it's so awesome. You realize that, you know, hey, that's, that's a product of, of every year of me sacrificing and giving to the Lord so the work can be preached in every nation so that everybody has the opportunity to have the opportunity like I've had. And the vast majority of us are super fired up about it. There's uh, three kinds of hearts though last week. There were the kinds that uh, gave willingly and cheerfully. Or maybe you didn't give because you had a financial hardship or whatever it might be, a last minute thing that you, know, you just couldn't see coming. But you totally intend on giving to the Lord and you've committed yourself to doing that. That's a willing heart. And I want all those people, you, you need to feel that way. If that's where your heart is, then you need to, hey amen, that's awesome. Then there was a number of us who gave, but gave because we felt compelled, but not willingly. Well, it's the right thing to do, you know. But you failed to see. You failed to see that your, your money that you are giving is going to preach the gospel and people will be saved because of what you did. I looked at my check, you know, and I do every year, and I look at it and I, I pray, God, please let this money bring much salvation to people wherever you want it, the gospel preached. I don't think about what it could buy me. I don't think about, you know, giving it up. I look at it and I go, you know what, this represents salvation for untold numbers of people. I have no idea how many people. If it's just one, if just one person we're saved because of what I'm getting right now. I would be so overjoyed to give it. But I, I'm just so confident as I look at it, I go, God has so much better plans for this. It's going to be more than one. But you missed out on the blessings of giving from the heart and really becoming like a Pharisee. Doing the right thing because it is the right thing, but, but missing the blessing of God of doing it with the right heart, of giving yourself to God and feeling the joy and, and the sense of peace that comes from doing what's right, not on the outside, but from the heart level. And you know what I'm talking about. There, there's no... Uh, you know, a pat on the back is nice and that's good. You did a great job and amen and all that sort of thing. But the peace that comes from God, when you know you've given yourself fully to the Lord, it, you know, you don't really need anybody to recognize it because you just go, it just feels so good to do the right thing. 
Then we have a, a, another, you know, a smaller contingent, which is, you know, not the majority here, but I want to speak about it. Uh, those with a bad heart who didn't give and had no intention of giving. And there are a few people like that in our congregation. Now, I just want to say a little bit here is that, that that's, not, that's not okay. That's not okay. That is not the heart of a disciple. That's the easy way out. That, that's the, the person who, who denies that, that Jesus came to die for all men. What is the sin of Sodom in Ezekiel 16? That God wiped them out from the earth. They were overfed and unconcerned. You know, I, I've lived in Africa. For four years, I lived in Africa. While I was junior high and high school. I lived in a country where wealth was described in owning a pair of soccer cleats. It was to own a pair of soccer cleats, not just, you know, like Adidas or Nike or whatever, to own a pair, even if all the nubs were rubbed off the bottom, to own a pair was a status symbol. It was a sign of wealth. We look here in America and say, well, I don't drive a Mercedes. You know, I don't drive this car or whatever. Because you drive the car doesn't mean that you're in sin, but you really have to evaluate your priorities. You know that uh, story that Jose shared, you know, being over there and, and seeing the, the kids in the Philippines living amongst all the trash. Yeah, I went there. I saw it. It's as, it's as bad as you can imagine. When I lived in Africa, I, I, I've shaken the hand of a leper. I know firsthand with my own eyes and my own nose what it smells and looks like to have leprosy. That cure for leprosy is only a few dollars. Jesus says in chapter 16 of Luke in verse 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. You know, you've heard that uh, expression, the best things in life are free. A lot of us aren't really convinced of that. You know, we like, you know, I'd, I'd like a million dollars to see if that really is true. I'd like to give it a run, you know, and just, you know, can I do my own lab experiment, God? You know, poor, okay, lots of money, and l let's see, you know, if really, if I keep coming back to these things that are free. Well, how much do you pay for a sunset? How much does it cost you? And is it any prettier for the wealthy people? Uh, how much do you pay for peace of mind? I'll go on and go on. You know, how much does it cost to buy a smile? You think about that. Jesus is trying to help us understand here, and, and I think this is one of the most dangerous sins that we face today in Southern California. Because it's not that obvious. It's hideable. It's hideable. Oh, well, all right, you know, sexual morality, drunkenness. Yeah, that's hard to hide those. 
Somebody go find out because there's usually more than one person involved. And you know the saying, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. You know, if you're living in that kind of, somebody go find you. You're like, oh man, shoot. But this is, is become, because we, we compare ourselves to the world and the people that we live around us, but we compare wrongly. You drive through the nicest neighborhoods and you say, well, why can't, you know, why can't that be me? And yet on the way to the will turn, how many of you, as you're looking at the homes you're driving here, are going, boy, I sure am lucky to live where I live. You know, some of you may think, well, you, you're just trying to get more money. No, what I did was I brought more problems on myself. If some of you are going to have attitudes at me, you're going to come talk to me about it. And you know what you're going to do? We're going to sit down, we're going to read the scripture again together. And you tell me what it says. Salvation is free. Friendship is free. Hope is free. Purpose in life is free. Good parenting is free. A good marriage is free. Salvation for your children is free. You don't need money. You need only need money. You just need to understand. It's a lie of Satan. It's a lie. The best things in life are free because that's what gravitated you to the Word of God when you became a Christian. And you need to remember that as we study the Word of God here. Let's turn back over to 1 John chapter 2 again. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28... And it says, and now dear children, children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. That's John's encouragement, you know, he's, you know, there's a lot of trouble here. I mean, you can imagine how would you feel if 50 people just got up and walked out of the service? We don't want to be here anymore. Oh, I swallow hard. You have to reevaluate your own life. You'd have to think about how much do I love the Lord? And John's encouraging them, hey, keep hanging in there. You're doing the right thing. You're pursuing righteousness. And we talked about that in the first part about walking in the light. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect, but it is the pattern of our life. We're trying. We're focused on finding the right path. John says, hang in there. Hang in there. And then he gives us our, our motivation in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Man, that's flat awesome. Have you ever sat in the mirror? You look in the mirror and just go, a child of God. You know, it may not start out that way. You know, so you're having a really bad day. You know, you just want to start crying in the bathroom. Oh, man. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And you start looking up, making eye contact with yourself. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of a God. This is awesome. You hear yourself that little pep talk? I hope I'm not the only one that's ever done that. <laughs> had a very intimate, you know, look into the bathroom sometimes there. But it's one of those things, you know, you, you think about it. And uh, when you're a kid, you, you, you know, you think about sometimes you're insecure and everything. And, uh, you know, it helped me a lot in sports, you know, when I was growing up. The things that my dad had taught me, my mom had taught me, and my family. Uh, you know, there's times I felt like quitting. Go, you don't quit. You're an Ostrom. Doggone it. You're going to puke before you get off this field. 
I literally would be playing soccer, you know, playing over in Africa. You know, it's a lot different than playing here. And I ran a lot. And every time I'd just be running, going, just stop, you know, have a substitute coming. Go, no, you're an Ostrom. If you pass out on the field, you pass out. But you're going to play until the game's over. And sometimes you need that motivation, you know. You feel like quitting. You feel like going, ah, you know, just bag it all. And then you go, but I'm a child of God. I've got salvation waiting for me. I just got to make it. Oh, I heard one of the most awesome quotes this week. But man, I had a chance to study the Bible with here this week. Just a great guy. I could just see us being total great friends. And as we're studying, he goes, you know, it's not so much that our life is so short. You just dead so long. <laughs> I said, you know? There you go. Sometimes it feels like it'll never end. We go, boy, I, I just did. Well, that just doesn't end, you know. There's no end in sight for being dead. But being a child of God, that's something special. It gives you an identity. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how many, you know, you got your older brother, Jesus. You know, many of you had older brothers, sisters going through high school. And a lot of times that was a big blessing. Don't mess with me. That's my brother. That's Jesus for you. He never lets you go through things that are too hard and, and will overwhelm you and kill you spiritually. He lets you go through some hard times to get you toughened up, get you stronger, give you more faith, give you more confidence in yourself. But if the devil tries to do just too much, bam, just jump in there. That's mine. Go on with your bad self. That's being a Christian. I mean, you, get, some of, you don't even think about it. You know, the angels. I mean, we read about the angels in the, in the, in the Old Testament. You go, wow, this is so phenomenal. And, you know, get, you're praying and everything. Ask for help. God's going, go help him. Go help her. Go help him. Go help her. Keep that demon off that man all the rest of the day. You know, keep those off of him. That's my children. How do you feel when somebody messes with your kids? Tell you what. Sorry, that slipped out there. <laughs> Little country. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell you anything else except that. <laughs> Let's go on. John reads, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. How awesome to see Jesus face to face. I had a dream about it when I was in college. That was like years before I was become a Christian. When I lived over in Africa, we lived up on this hill, it was, you know, fairly high elevation, about 1,300 feet, and it went down into a valley. And then you see this big rolling valley on the other side, a hill coming on up. It's all grass and everything with trees in the bottom. In the mornings, we started school at 6.30, so you could be grateful that you go to school here in the U.S. Sleeping in until 8. <laughs> but as you walk to school in the morning, the mist would, would cover the valley. You could see the other, the other hill, but the mist would cover the valley until the sun came up. And I remember having this dream. Uh, yeah, I was still sinner, still pagan. You know, wasn't being a disciple of Jesus at all. But somehow I believe, you know, I don't know if God was trying to tell me I'd get there someday or what. 
But I remember sitting there, I was having this dream, I think it was early in the morning. And I had a dream that I got to see Jesus walking over that mist. And as I ran, started running down the hill, I jumped and I didn't go back down. And I got to run up to meet Jesus. And it, it was such a powerful dream for me that I actually shouted hallelujah in my dream, woke myself up. <laughs> I checked, see if my roommate woke up. <laughs> well, this won't be hard to explain. <laughs> but that powerful dream of, of that sensation of running and leaping in the air to meet Jesus and then running across the mist to fall at his feet. Man, I hope that you have a dream like that for your life the inexpressible joy of knowing you made it. Mm. Don't let the devil take that dream away. The things that the world values, God considers detestable. Keep your focus on God. Let's finish out our passage here. In verse four, it says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. John again closes out another passage here and giving very specific practical, how do you know if you're doing the right thing? We talk about, you know, a lot of these things here about loving people. It's, it's necessary. Jesus loved people. But so many times we fail to take the step beyond it and really understand what it meant when Jesus loved people. We think the cross, and that's true. What about all the times he put up with the disciples being faithless or stupid, dull. You know, I heard Marty make a good point the other night is that none of the apostles were ever used as good examples. <laughs> it was always the foreigners. You know, the Canaanite woman. You know, this, uh, the Samaritan that got healed of leprosy out of the 10, you know, he's the only one that came back. Yo, man, I just got to hurt, you know. So you're one of the 12, go, when is she just going to use me? I've been, I've been here three, three years. Centurion, he, he didn't even meet Jesus. Jesus thought he was awesome. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like that. Hi, Christian, wow. Somebody can just use me as a good example in a sermon, you know, or at least Bible talk. <laughs> I think John let that spur him on. You know what I'm saying? He went on to do great things. He goes, hey, I, I might have been a son of, son of doofus. Not son of thunder, son of doofus in the beginning. And he went on to be a very powerful man. But John really calls us back here. You know, in verse seven, he says, again, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. You are responsible for your own relationship with God. You are responsible for making sure that you are not led astray. You have a Bible. No, it's amazing. Actually, people ask you, have you been reading it? 
But John gives that charge. Do not let anyone lead you astray. And he says, this is how we know. If you do us right, you're righteous. Just as Jesus was righteous. If you are sinning, oh, the devil was a sinner since the beginning. So there you go. You know what I said? We have light and darkness. Sinner. Well, not sinner. We're all sinners. Sinful. Rebellious and righteous. You know, John, you know, I said, with older brother John coming after us here last week. He's, he's still doing it. And helping us to make choices. It's easier to make a choice when you understand you only have two options. You know, the other night I saw Jerry Seinfeld on TV. And uh, he said the number one fear that people have is public speaking. He said number two is death. He goes, number two, death. He says, so what you're saying is people would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. It cracked me up. But a lot of times fear holds us back from doing the right thing. What my, what my friends think. What will your family think. We went over that last week, right? They don't think about you at all. And even if they do, really, what does it matter? There's plenty of people that don't like you already, before you were a Christian. And there may be just as many people who don't like you now, but there's a whole lot more people that like you now than they did before. Yes. So you're not getting more people who don't like you. You've increased the number of people who do like you. Just stop being so concerned about being liked or disliked. Being focused on doing what's right in the eyes of God. John finishes out there, hey, children of God, you're gonna do what's right. If you're not a child of God, you're not going to do what's right, and you're not going to love your brother. Again, Jesus gets, or John gets down to the nitty-gritty of, if you say you love God, you must love the fellowship. You must be concerned for the other members of the body of Christ. You must demonstrate with your life, not just your mouth, that you love and are committed to one another. If you're going to say you love God. And doing so, it's one of those things that as we demonstrate our love for each other, as we build those friendships, as we build it, the challenges are easier to take. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be challenged by a friend. Somebody I know knows me, knows my life. To be challenged on that level, rather than just hearing some vague, you know, direction from the pulpit on Sunday morning. I realize, you know, to some extent, I, you know, get you to think a little bit, but my influence is somewhat limited because I don't go home with you. You know, if I was in the back of the car, you know, finishing my sermon on the way home, you know, and then I'll ask you questions, well, what did you think? Then, you know, then maybe that might be a little more helpful for you in the long run. But hopefully as we study the book of First John, you can take the book home with you. You got, it's in your Bible. It's, no, it's not supplemental reading, you know, it's in there. You read it and let John speak to you. Amen, the lesson is yours.